Hello, this is Jude Socrates. Welcome to our second video in my series for multivariable calculus, Math 5C at Pasadena City College. So in our first video, we learned about GeoGebra and we learned how to plot points and vectors in GeoGebra. And we also learned about vector arithmetic, okay, how to add two vectors, uh, multiply by a scalar, subtract two vectors, and we learned some of the properties of this vector arithmetic. Okay, so hopefully you have uh, played with GeoGebra a little bit, tried out the homework problems, take screenshots. So if you have not done that, then it would be a good idea to try that first and then come back to this video where we will continue now with the length of the vector and then we're going to talk about dot products. So if you're ready, that starts at the bottom of page eight, but the definition is actually at the top of page nine. So I will see you there in one second. Okay, so here we are at the top of page nine and here are the definitions for the length of a vector in R2 or a vector in R3. So there are two other words for length and they are norm or magnitude, okay? So if you'd rather say three syllables instead of just one, you can say magnitude. Okay, so for V1, V2, a vector from R2, the length is the square root of V1 squared plus V2 squared. And for a vector W from R3, the length of W is the square root of W1 squared plus W2 squared plus W3 squared. So the formulas are, of course, very similar to each other. We just have one extra component for a vector in R3. You square all of the components, essentially, and then you add them together. Uh, what happens if you get a length of one? Well, that is called a unit vector. So whether you are in R2 or R3, if you get a vector of length one, you get a unit vector. So here are a couple of uh, easy examples, right? So for three minus four in R2, you square the components, you get nine and 16, they add up to 25. The square root of 25 is just five. Okay, so the length of that vector is five. And similarly, if you add one more component, let's say a two, then you will add an extra plus four. Okay, so you will get 29 instead. The magnitude of that vector is 29. Okay, so don't worry, we'll go to GeoGebra in a minute and we'll actually see some of these vectors. Uh, but let's think about three minus four a little bit. Okay, so here's the diagram for three minus four. Let me scoot it up a little bit. Okay, there we go. Now we can see the whole thing. So here is three, here's negative four. So of course, uh, that's just the right triangle. Okay, so the Pythagorean theorem tells us that three squared plus four squared is the hypotenuse squared. Okay, and that is where, of course, we get the formula for the length of a vector. It's just a consequence of the Pythagorean theorem. All right, so here we are in GeoGebra, and let's see why the length of a vector in R3 is determined by W1 squared plus W2 squared plus W3 squared, okay? So let's type in that vector that we saw, which was three, negative four, and then there's an extra two, okay? So there is our vector, and let's rotate it a little bit. So, of course, it's sticking out of the xy plane, okay? Now, why is this? Um, why is its length square root of 29? Okay, why is that the correct answer? Okay. Well, um, let's think about how to create that vector, okay? So we can make a vector diagram, okay, remember how to add two vectors, by starting with three negative four on the xy plane, which means we will put a zero for z. Okay, so there we go. And then from the tip of that vector, we will add the vector zero, zero, two. 
Okay, so um, how do you make that vector? So we will write, uh, we will go from three, negative four, zero, and we will go to zero, zero, two. Whoops, uh, two, oh, I'm sorry, to three minus four, two. Ha ha ha. Okay, so there we go. That completes our vector diagram. Okay, so this vector, which GeoGebra called V, plus ve this vector, which it called W, adds up to U. Okay, and yeah, here's V, here is U, and yes, we are just missing the 2, and that comes from this 0, 0, 2. Okay, so um, this vector, 3 minus 4, 0, is on the xy plane. So, of course, the length of that vector is 5. That's what we saw for the R2 example. Okay, so now that we have this right triangle, okay, and why is it a right triangle? Because this vector W is sticking straight out of the xy plane. It's like you're standing up, okay, so you are perpendicular to the ground. This vector is perpendicular to the xy plane. So therefore, it is also perpendicular to this vector. Okay, um, in a few minutes, we are going to talk about angles in general on the plane and in space. Okay, so being perpendicular is a specific example of a kind of angle. Okay, so now that we know that this is a right triangle, or at least we, we believe, we, we feel strongly that that is a right triangle, then we can execute the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so this is 5 and this is 2, so the length of the hypotenuse is 5 squared plus 2 squared, which is 29. Okay, so that is where we get square root of 29. Okay, now uh, we also mentioned unit vectors. Okay, so these are obviously not unit vectors because they have length 5 and square root of 29, and this is obviously of length 2, okay? Uh, I forgot in our first video to mention three famous uh, vectors in R3, and those are the vectors i, j, and k, all right? And they're very simple vectors, okay? They are simply 1, 0, 0, ooh, there it is, and 0, oops, can't spell today, 0, 1, 0. Okay, Ooh, what happened there? Okay, sorry about that, some technical difficulties, so I started over. Here is the vector 1, 0, 0, okay, so it's just on the x-axis, of course. And let's make the next vector, which is 0, 1, 0, there it is, and the last vector, 0, 0, 1, okay? So those are the three vectors, i, j, and k, all right? So they're also called the standard basis vectors for R3, and that is because you can create any vector using those three vectors just by multiplying them by suitable constants. Okay, so let's zoom out a little bit. Okay, so there we go. So they are unit vectors. Okay, they're obviously of lengths 1. 1 squared, 0, 0. Square root of 1 is 1 for all three of them. Okay, so if you want to create any vector, you can just add multiples of those vectors. Okay, so um, I neglected to label them. So they're called u, v, and w. So if I have, for example, 3u, plus 5v minus 2w. Okay, so there we go. We get the vector 3, 5, minus 2. Okay, and that's because you just have 1s in the x, y, and z coordinates. Okay, so when you multiply by uh, the first vector by 3, you get the 3 there. Second by 5, you get 5. Third by minus 2, you get minus 2. Okay, so that gives us the vector 3, 5, negative, w, negative 2, okay, which is right there, okay? So obviously you can create any vector that you want 
using these three unit vectors. All right, so we're back in our PDF file. And the concept of a length of the vector naturally allows us to extend the distance formula for three dimensions. So if you have two points and they're labeled A1, B1, C1 and A2, B2, C2, we can make the vector between them just as we did in our first video. So the vector from P to Q is simply A2 minus A1, B2 minus B1, and C2 minus C1. Those are the three components, okay? So therefore, we can think of the distance between the two points as the length of that vector between them, all right? And by our formula for the length of the vector, all we have to do is square these three components and then add them together, okay? So let's uh, make a new example in GeoGebra and let's find the distance between two points there. All right, so here we are. Let's plot two random points, okay? So how about let's have negative five to seven. Okay, there's our first point. And how about let's plot um, three, negative one, four. How about that? Okay, so we have those two points in partition space, okay? So let's find the distance between them, okay? So that would be the separation between those two points. Oh, look how convenient. They kind of have a, a rough idea. So that looks like five, that looks like negative five. Okay, so the distance might be approximately 10, okay? But of course, that's a very, very rough estimate. However, we can certainly verify or at least have some confidence that our exact answer is correct, okay? So the idea is to create the vector between those two points, okay? So the vector would be, what's the difference? Three minus negative five is eight, and then minus one minus two is minus three, and then four minus seven, that is also negative three. Okay, so that is the vector between those two points, okay? And we can check our answer because we can also tell GeoGebra to create the vector for us. What is the vector from A to B? Okay, same answer, eight minus three minus three. Okay, so, so far so good. Uh, can we find the length of that vector in our heads? Uh, let's try it. Okay, we got 64, 9, and another 9. Ooh, can you add all of that in your head? Okay, what would I do? 9 plus 9 is 18. Add 18 to 64. Uh, 8 and 4 is 12. Carry the 1. So, 6, 7, 84. No, 82. Okay, so that should be... Uh, what is inside the radical. So we will get uh, square root of 82. Okay, that's about nine. Okay, so that should be the length of our vector, square root of 82. Okay, so we're back in our lecture file. And just like we have properties for vector arithmetic that we saw in our first video, there are properties for the length functions, okay? So for any scalar, any real number k, and any vector in R2 or R3, the length of the scalar multiple k times v is the same as the length of the original vector v multiplied by the absolute value of k, All right? So why is there an absolute value? Well, the length is always a positive number or zero, okay? So uh, we can't have just k over there because if you multiply by negative 2, negative 2 times a positive number would be, give you a negative number, okay? So there should at least be an absolute value there. But we will prove in a minute why this formula is exactly correct, okay? So I mentioned it could be 0, okay? Uh, what should happen? Well, the length of any vector is at least 0, 
but the length of the vector is zero if and only if that vector were already the zero vector in R2 or in R3. Okay, now why is that? Okay, if you have the zero vector, okay, then of course all components are zero. So you square them, you still get zero, add them together, you still get zero, square root of zero is zero. Okay, now what if it is not the zero vector? Okay, then at least one of the components is not the number zero. Okay, maybe it's negative three, maybe it's positive five. Okay, or maybe it's just one half, something small. Okay, but it doesn't matter how small it is, whether it's positive or negative. When you square it, you're going to get a positive answer. Okay, one of the components is not zero. When you square it, it becomes positive. Okay, now what about the two other components? Okay, well, they will also square to either zero or a positive number, okay? So there's no way that you can add them to this first number, which is already positive, and get zero, okay? Once you turn positive, you stay positive, even if you add two more numbers, which at the very least are zero, okay? So you get a positive number under the square root, you take the square root, it becomes positive, okay? How do you create unit vectors? Very easy. If you have a non-zero vector, then you can multiply that vector by the reciprocal of the length or the negative of the reciprocal of the length. And that should give you unit vectors which are par parallel to that given non-zero vector. Okay, so I actually have a proof for uh, the formula and a follow-up to our previous example. Okay, so let's do it for R2. Okay, when you have k times v, you have k1, v1, k2, k, kv2. So when you square those, you'll get kv1 quantity squared plus kv2 quantity squared. The k squared goes out, of course, and you can factor them from the two terms and separate the two factors inside the square root, okay? So we use the product formula for square root, the square root of a times b is the square root of a times the square root of b, as long as both quantities are at least zero, okay? So what is square root of k squared? That's where the absolute value of k comes in, okay? Think about it, okay? k is any real number, okay? So if it were five, you'll get 25 when you square. Square root of 25, you're back to five, okay? But if you start out with negative five, then when you square, it's still 25. So the square root is still five, okay? So if you start with negative five, your answer will be positive five, okay? All right, so, um, here is the vector from our previous example, and here are the two unit vectors which are parallel to it. Okay, we saw that the length is square root of 29. So if you divide the vector by one over, uh, if you divide by square root of 29, or by the negative of square root of 29, then you get two unit vectors. So let's go back to GeoGebra and look those over. All right, so here was, here was our earlier example, and I hid the two vectors uh, that made up our right triangle. So we only have our original vector. So uh, we can create two unit vectors. So it's called them u1 will be u divided by the square root of 29. How do you make a square root? You will need the keyboard button over here. Ooh, so there is the square root option, and you go 29 in there, and then you just press enter. Ah, okay. So there you see, there is u1, okay? So, of course, as a multiple of u, they are parallel to each other, and there's one over there, and yeah, it looks like the length of that vector should be a one, okay? So, of course, the other unit vector will be scroll down u2 will be u or negative u 
divided by the square root of 29. Okay, now of course, if you were smarter than me, you would have just said, oh, negative u1. Okay, that would have been a whole lot faster. Voila, so there is the second unit vector, u2, which is directly opposite of u1. And of course, both of them are parallel to the original vector, and both of them are unit vectors. Okay, so our next topic is the dot product. And if you have two vectors from R3, u1, u2, u3, and v1, v2, v3, then their dot product, u dot v, is simply the product of the corresponding components added all together. All right, so you have u1, v1, u2, v2, and u3, v3. Take those products, add them together, you get a number, a scalar, all right? So u dot v is a number, not a vector, okay? So notice also that if you take the dot product of a vector with itself, then you will get u1 times u1, u2 times u2, u3 times u3. Oh, those are just squares, okay? And if you remember, those appeared in the formula for the length of a vector, except that was all inside a square root, okay? So if you didn't take the square root, then that would be the length of the vector squared, right? So another way to think about it is that the length of u is just the square root of the dot product of u with itself, okay? And let me warn you about grammar, okay? You, you write the length of u squared, you don't write the vector u to the power two that is meaningless and ugly, okay? So please do not ever do that, okay? So from here, we are going to look at something new. We're going to look at Scientific Notebook. It is a word processing program, but it also allows us to uh, perform computations, okay? So we are going to do our next example in that environment. All right, let me introduce you to Scientific Notebook. Okay, so this is our environment. You can uh, put in special characters, uh, summations, delimiters. We can evaluate um, some computations and there are some more special symbols over here. Okay, so we will be using this a lot uh, in this video series um, to create our examples and to perform computations. Okay, so here I made an example for you. We have two vectors and we want to find their dot product. Okay, so that's what we want. There we go. Okay, so the formula says multiply the components together by pair and then add them all together. So we have negative three times five plus two times negative four plus four times two. Okay, you probably know the answer by now, okay? So we have negative 15 minus eight and then plus eight. Okay, so that ends up as just negative 15, okay? So that's the dot product of those two vectors and the answer is a scalar, it is not a vector. All right, so in a few minutes, we are going to find out that that negative 15 actually plays a role in a physical or geometric um, meaning uh, with regards to those two vectors, okay? But before we do that, we have to look at some properties of the dot product first, and then we can see the meaning of that negative 15, okay? So <clears throat> here are six properties. The dot product is commutative. U dot V and V dot U are exactly the same. It distributes on the right as well as on the left, right? So if you have V plus W and then you dot that with U, it will be the same as U dot V plus U dot W, okay? Similarly for this formula. Homogeneity, it is a fancy name for the associative property. If you multiply u by a scalar and then dot it with the vector v, 
that scalar can go outside. So you can do u dot v first and then multiply that scalar by the other scalar k. That k can also go migrate with v. So you can have k times v first and then dotted with u. Those all should give you the exact same answer. What happens with a zero vector? Well, all the components are already zero. You multiply them by any number. You still get zero. Add them all together. You still get zero. OK. Now, we already saw that the length of a non-zero vector is not zero. It's strictly positive. OK. So that is repeated in the positivity property. If u is not the zero vector, then u dotted to itself, which is the length squared, has to be strictly positive. Okay, so here we have the proof of the left distributive property. All right, the second property over here. And again, just like in the first video, all you have to do is spell out what happens to the vectors. Okay, and you have three vectors here, so you just have to spell them out. Okay, what is u? What is v? what is w okay so on the left side we have u plus v so let's make that here is u plus v it means u1 plus v1 u2 plus v2 u3 plus v3 okay what's next we have to dot with w so dot with w you dot with w here what does it mean multiply first component with the first component here so we have u1 plus v1 times w1. And similarly for the other two pairs of components. You know how to read. Now, what can we do next? Well, we have the distributive property for real numbers. So this first quantity is the same as u1w1 plus v1w1. And similarly for these two other quantities. Okay, so now what do we do? Well, if you put the terms containing u's and w's together, hmm, there are three of those pairs. So let's put them closer to each other, next to each other. And that leaves the pairs containing v's and w's together. Ooh, but who are those? That is exactly what you're looking at right here, is u dot w, and this is exactly v dot w. That's all you have to do, okay? Separate them so that these three components form that dot product on the right side, and the other three form this dot product on the right side. Okay, so we are now ready to really understand what is the meaning of that negative 15 answer that we got for the dot product. But see it, we are going to invoke the law of cosines from trigonometry, which you have probably forgotten by now. But that's okay. It's here, right? Right here in front of our very eyes. So it says, if you have a triangle, with sides A, B, and C, and you call the angle between two sides, let's say A and B, as theta, then the law of cosine says the square of the length of the opposite side to theta, C squared, is the sum of the squares of the lengths of the two sides that form theta, minus twice their lengths and the cosine of that angle theta, okay? So obviously that is why it is called the law of cosines, all right? So what does this have to do with the dot products? Okay, so remember that the vector sum can be interpreted using triangles, okay? So uh, this was the diagram. Let me scoot over here. This was the diagram from a few pages ago, okay? The parallelogram principle. We're going to look at that 
portion which involves the vector difference. Okay, so if this is the vector u and this is the vector v, this is the vector u minus v. Okay, so quick review. Why isn't it v minus u? Or why isn't it u plus v? Okay, so uh, one quick way to see that is to remember that adding two vectors involves following tail to head, tail to head. Okay, so does this diagram follow that principle? Okay, tail to head, that's the vector v. Tail to head, we think that's u minus v. Okay, so the principle says if you have add v to u minus v, you should get this other vector. Okay, what is v plus u minus v? Ah, the v's cancel and we are left with u. Okay, so that is why u minus v is correct. Okay, well, what if it wasn't labeled for you? Okay, well, this is where algebra comes in. Okay, if you don't know who this vector is, let's call it x. Okay, so what does the principle tell us? v plus x should be equal to u v plus x equals u. Solve for x, x is u minus v. Ta-da! There's a vector u minus v. Okay, so let's move on. Here is the angle between these two vectors. Okay, so le let me um, ex uh, clarify that u and v need to be non-zero vectors. Okay, because if one of them is zero, uh, you don't have a triangle, you have um, a dot <laughs> or um, two sides without a third side. That won't make any sense. Okay, so you need two non-zero vectors to begin with. Okay, so theta is the angle between them. The law of cosine says that the length of the opposite side, which would be the vector u minus v squared, should be the lengths of the two sides squared added together minus twice their lengths times the cosine of the angle between them. Okay, so um, the right side is made of three terms, but each term is relatively simple. Okay, it's the left side that is complicated because you have u minus v length squared. Okay, but remember that the length of a vector squared is simply the dot product of the vector with itself. Okay, so the length of u minus v squared is the dot product of u minus v with u minus v. Okay, so let's keep scrolling up here. And what do we see? We can apply the two distributive properties so we can keep the left factor together, dot it with the first term u, and then we have a minus here. Keep the first term factored, dot it now with v. Okay, so think of u minus v as a chunk. Okay, copy it, make two copies, and then you have the dot u here and the minus dot v over there. Okay, now we can apply the other distributive property. We have u dot u minus v dot u minus u dot v minus minus plus v dot v. Okay, however, we know that the dot product is commutative. So minus v dot u and minus u dot v are exactly the same. They don't cancel, they double. Okay, so you get minus 2 u dot v in the middle, but u dot u is also the length of u squared. We just said that. v dot v is also length of v squared. Okay, so that is the left side. Compare it now to the right side. Ooh, do you see what I see? Those two terms also appear on the right side. Aha! And so we can cancel them and divide by negative 2 
and we are left with u dot v on the left, length of u, length of v, cosine theta on the right. Aha! So therefore, that allows us now to see the geometric meaning of the dot product. Okay? If u and v are non-zero vectors in R2, then their dot product is simply the product of their magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between them. Okay? So because of that, we can now solve for cosine theta. You have non-zero vectors, so these lengths are not zero. We can divide by them. So therefore, cosine theta is the dot product of u and v divided by the two lengths, the length of u times the length of v. Now, um, this is where I need to take a couple of pens <laughs> and show you why that angle theta could only be between 0 and pi. You don't have to go beyond pi. Okay, So here are two vectors. They're going the same direction. So the angle is 0. Okay, Make the angle bigger, bigger, bigger. Oh, OK. So we're going to talk about orthogonal vectors in the next video. Those are orthogonal or perpendicular vectors. Okay. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And now that angle is pi, okay, 180 degrees. And can't you go bigger than pi? Uh, yeah, sure, yeah, there, there it is. Uh, oh, 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 however, if you look at it this way, aha, uh -huh, that angle is now smaller than pi, aha. Uh -huh. So therefore, we can restrict the angle between two vectors to be between zero and pi. All right, so we're back in scientific notebook and let's keep going with our previous example. We will now find the exact value of cosine theta, where theta is the angle between these two vectors, and then we will approximate it in degrees. After that, we're going to go back to algebra and we're going to look at those two vectors and we will eyeball that angle and hopefully we will agree on that answer. Okay, so the formula says that cosine theta is the dot product of the two vectors. Oh, let me show off. Here's how you make a fraction. So you need u dot v in the numerator, and then in the denominator, you need the product of the two lengths. So I can get a magnitude symbol over there, there it is. I need two of them. So let me make a copy of that. There you go. And I can just copy u in here and v in there. Okay. Scientific Notebook 101. So, u dot v we already have over here. Negative 15. So let's put that in the numerator. Length of u. Okay, so remember how it works. We have square, square, square. Ooh, those numbers look familiar. 9 plus 16, 25 plus 4, 29. Those are the same numbers in our previous example, but in a different order. Okay, so here we have the radical symbol. We get square root of 29. Whoops, wrong place. It should go over here. Okay, there we go. Now, how about the length of v? So I need another square root. Let me just make a copy of that here. And what have we got? We got 25 and 16 and 4, 20, ooh, 45. Square root of 45. Oh, oh, and that's awesome because a 3 can go out. So we can make it 3 squared to 5. So we can put 3 in front over there. And now that simplifies a little bit. So we will get negative 5 over square root of 29 squared to 5. Oh, and if you want to keep going, if you really want to keep going, you can simplify this as negative square root of 5 over square root of 29. 
Okay. So um, that is, what is that approximately? Okay, so scientific notebook can perform that calculation for us. That is uh, an approximate value and it's about this much. Okay, so now we can again ask scientific notebook to do cosine inverse of this number. Okay, approximate it for us please. Okay, the answer is in radians because that is how scientific notebook behaves. Okay, so if you want it in degrees, I want it in degrees because we're going to verify our answer in GeoGebra. So to convert, what's the conversion factor? There are 180 degrees in every pi radian. Not going to tell you how I did that. Okay, so it's just a keystroke sequence. What is that approximately? It is 114.5 degrees, okay? So it is obtuse, okay? It's bigger than 90 degrees. Well, because there's a minus sign there. If the cosine is negative, you're in the second quadrant. So it's over 100 and uh, over 90 degrees, okay? So let us go to GeoGebra now, and we are going to plot those two vectors, and we're going to see that 114 degrees is a reasonable answer. Okay, so here we go. Vector negative three, two, four, parentheses, negative three, two, four, and the other is five, negative four, two. Aha, okay, so those are our two vectors, and if we turn it around and look this way, walk this way, does that look like 114 degrees to you? Yeah, it does to me, okay? All right, so that is the end of our video. I hope you enjoyed it. So in our next video, we are going to continue with the concept of orthogonality, and we will use that to construct planes in space. I already mentioned the xy plane earlier. It's going to get a lot more general than that. Okay, so until our next video, uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and get some practice on GeoGebra and in your homework. I will see you next time.